All right, everybody, here we are in the Wire for Healing community, and we're so honored to have Dr. Thomas Seafried of Boston College back with us to talk about metabolic health and metabolic treatment for cancer. And uh, Dr. Seafried, I was hoping you could just start us off by introducing yourself and give us a bit of an idea of your background. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Scott. It's nice to be here. Um, Tom Seafried, Professor of Biology at Boston College. Uh, I have an active research program in cancer metabolism. I uh, teach general biology to the undergraduates and also cancer metabolism to uh, advanced undergraduates and graduate students. So we've we've been working on uh, biochemistry and genetics uh, of cancer and epilepsy for decades here at, at Boston College. So, um, and uh, publishing many papers, open access, so that the research can be seen and evaluated uh, by anyone that would have a computer. So, uh, um, so that's pretty much pretty much it. And as I said, uh, where our key thing, key key uh, research, is using diet drug combinations that we think will be more effective in managing cancer than the current standards of care. So we do most of our work preclinically. We, we have the developed the best uh, preclinical models for cancer. And uh, the, the work, the, the evidence that we collect then is shared with members of the medical community for application to their patient populations. So that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And can you also provide us uh, with a, a just a very brief nutshell as to what metabolic therapy consists of exactly? Yeah, well, metabolic therapy exploits the the underlying uh, metabolic problem that uh, all cancer cells have. So, um, metabolic therapy is to deprive cancer cells of the two major fuels that drive dysregulated cell growth. So cancer is a disorder of dysregulated growth, cell division out of control. So uh, uh, all anything that is living and grows requires energy. Energy is the base plate for all activities. So we, we ask and we, 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 challenge these cells, like where, where are they getting their energy for dysregulated growth? And it turns out that they, they use a fermentation. They, they grow with energy without oxygen. So cancer cells are different from normal cells because they can grow effectively without oxygen. So they use fermentation. Fermentation is energy without oxygen. And metabolic therapy is designed to restrict the availability of fermentable fuels that drive the dysregulated growth. So what are the fermentable fuels? And we have interrogated these cancer cells and, and found that they cannot survive without the sugar glucose or the amino acid glutamine. So metabolic therapy then uses diet drug combinations to simultaneously restrict the availability of the fermentable fuels while transitioning the body over to fatty acids and ketones, which normal cells can use, but the tumor cells cannot. So, uh, so this is the essence of metabolic therapy, restricting the fermentable fuels of the cancer cells so they can no longer grow. So your, your theory is that cancer is a, is a metabolic syndrome. What about if somebody has insulin resistance, for example, how is what what does metabolic syndrome consist of? How is our metabolism dysfunction in a state of metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance? Yeah, well, um, obviously, in those particular cases, um, you know, there was an abuse. Uh, people become insulin resistant in part uh, by lack of exercise and eating the wrong foods. Um, and their body doesn't respond. So in those cases, you have high blood sugar together with high insulin. And um, that's a disastrous, uh, not a very healthy uh, situation. Um, many folks that are obese have insulin resistance. Uh, they're this kind. 
it, it, it can also provoke the onset of cancer by leading to systemic inflammation, which is a lot of these things are all linked together. Um, if you have insulin resistance, type, di type two diabetes, you're at great risk for cardiovascular disease, dementia, cancer. Uh, you're, 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 so the, the bottom line is if you have insulin, now insulin resistance is a curable condition with diet and, diet and exercise. You don't need Ozempic. You don't need all these crazy drugs that people are forcing on you. I mean, of course, it's easier to do that, but it's uh, the uh, Verda Health, uh, Jeff Volick and, and Finney and those guys built the Verda Health, which is managing insulin insensitivity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes, all with diet and exercise. So, but it's hard, it's more challenging to do that than take pills. The problem was if you take pills, you get, you got to worry about, uh, uh, off target effects eventually. So, um, you know, I'll leave it up to different people to decide that, but, you know, I don't work specifically with insulin, uh, resistance, insulin sensitivity. Mm. We work mostly with cancer, although those things are provocative for the, for the development of dysregulated cell growth. Yeah. I figured that metabolic syndrome would, would definitely compound, compound the other issue of the cancer metabolism. So, so what happens can you explain what would happen with cancer cells in a person with a fully functional metabolism and a person with metabolic syndrome, say? Well, metabolic syndrome, um, in my mind, I think usually is associated with more elevated blood sugar um, and elevated insulin. So both of those are provocative for rapid tumor growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no, there's no question about it. I mean, we published paper in, in 03 uh, in the mouse showing a direct relationship between blood sugar, insulin levels, and how fast tumors grow. And we used uh, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, uh, which is um, a modification of the insulin molecule itself. But, but there was a clear relationship, uh, high sugar, high insulin, fast tumor growth, mm -hmm. low sugar, low insulin, slow tumor growth. Um, and of course, we did this in the mouse with very, very carefully controlled studies. But since that paper was published, we have now found um, all many of the major cancers uh, in people have been shown to have the same relationship, whether it's brain cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, a variety of other, other cancers, clear relationship. The higher your blood sugar and insulin, the faster. If you have a cancer, it's going to grow faster. So... Um, uh, there's no question about it. I mean, the cancer cell is fueled in large part by sugar and insulin is a growth factor for, uh, for, for, for pushing the sugar into cells. So, so obviously your cancer cells are going to grow faster. If people want to, if people are act excited to have their tumors grow fast, they should really get their sugar, <laughs> blood sugars as high as they possibly can. So you no. can drink gallons of sweet tea and Coca-Cola you know, some people like to have a race to see how fast they can get their cancers to grow. So uh, we have a lot of things in our in our nutritional society that can accelerate tumor growth. <laughs> yeah, and, and you've got one of those in a box right next to you, don't you? Yeah, the Twinkies. <laughs> well, the Twinkie, you know, we always like to bring our, 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 our I always said the Twinkie, right? the 10-year-old Twinkies. The, this is it here, the 10-year-old guys. So, um, you know, it's all artificial. Um, I don't think there's any natural ingredient uh, in a Twinkie, uh, but they're engineered to last a long time and to taste uh, very sweet. So, um, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you would put in a kid's lunchbox. Um, you know, the, the, the issue, of course, is, is that when you're young, uh, your body can tolerate massive uh, uh, nutritional abuse. Um, I was a kid, too. I mean, we drank and ate pizza. We drank Coca-Cola and Little did I know that it, if you do this for like 40, 50 years, it's going to kill you <laughs> but or make you demented or, or give you cancer or something like this. But, you know, when you're young, you can smoke, you can drink, you can eat all kinds of crap food and um, uh, and seem to survive. But it's just decades long of abuse like this uh, that accumulates uh, your cells eventually get brutalized. And the energy metabolism in the cells gets damaged, and the cells then start to uh, insulin insensitivity, fermentation. And you go down, go down right that path. So clearly, uh, it, there's always a connection uh, between the level of health and how much abuse your body takes from lack of exercise and high consumption of poorly nutritious foods, uh, together with an environment that has provocative carcinogenic chemicals. So when you put this mix together, there should be no surprise 
why we have so much cancer, dementia, heart disease, uh, uh, type two diabetes, and all the different things that seem to be afflicting the society. Not a not mystery. There's no mystery here. Dr. Dr. Seafree, what would it take for us to to get you to eat one of those Twinkies right now? Can we pay <laughs> no, you? nothing. No, no. Uh, but, I tell but, you what. Uh, I, I tell you what. I, I I'll, I'll I'll make you a deal. Yeah. I I'll eat one of these Twinkies. If you donate one hundred thousand dollars to our research program, <laughs> all right? you know what? If if we if we raise it, uh, I will do that. I, yeah, I want to. Push... I'll put I'll put myself at risk. Or um, it didn't kill the mouse, as far as I know. When he ate it, uh, he ate half of one of these things. I um, and again, there's a he ten, probably died very, of cancer before I, he could finish I, it. I, I don't know, but he he got away, so I, it didn't kill him. On the, I didn't find his dead body. Uh, with a piece of Twinkie hanging out of it, um, but but uh, <laughs> I still I think to... he's down at the oncology center getting chemo. Yeah, yeah, but he might be there. But <laughs> but um, uh, I use it as a prop in my in my biology class to show the kids uh, what these Twinkies look like. And, and I know in in a couple of uh, there's a bar in in Georgia uh, Athens uh, uh, um, yeah Athens Georgia where they deep fry the Twinkie. And then they pour chocolate syrup and powdered sugar on top of it, right? To give it the turbo Twinkie. <laughs> and people are pounding it down like there's no tomorrow. So uh, obviously God. they're not concerned about type two diabetes or, and you know, mostly they're young people. You don't, you don't, you don't see that in too many older folks. <laughs> they kind of know that this will kill them. You know. <laughs> so let's talk about ketosis a little bit and how you're using that to reverse um, metabolic syndrome and starve out the cancer cells. Does a person have to get fairly deep into ketosis? I know that you've used some fasting mimicking diets and some some intermittent fasting. Yeah, you this. can do you can get into ketosis with any diet. It, it's not it's it's diet we've seen it with Mediterranean diets, vegan diets, carnivore diets, pescatarian diets, all kinds of diets. Um and you'll come, everybody will come to know that whatever they're eating, whatever diet, in order to get into ketosis, they're going to have to eat a hell of a lot less of whatever they were eating. That's for sure. Um, and then you have the glucose ketone index, which we published, um, allows people to know uh, when they're in these so-called uh, uh, nutritional ketotic states. Usually it's about 2.0 or below the ratio of in millimolar of glucose to ketone bodies in the bloodstream. Um, you can use the Keto Mojo or other devices that you can buy on Amazon, as long as the device can can both calculate the blood sugar and the ketones together in the same meter, uh, then you can get yourself into nutritional ketosis, um, which is usually a is usually a, a GKI. As I said, I, you know, if, if you don't have cancer or you you can do a five uh, five point zero or below, but for cancer patients to kill tumors. We usually think it's uh, 2.0, or it's better to be below 1.0. Um, when you when that means when your your ratio of blood ketone your ketones in the blood are surpassed the millimolar of glucose in the blood, and then uh, now this is not ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis is a life threatening condition. That's when your ketones are in the in the 20 millimolar range. Uh, we're talking nutritional ketosis. They're in the two to four or five millimolar range. Ketoacidosis is a very deadly thing. You have high blood sugar. You have high ketones. It's what you see in type one diabetes and sometimes type two diabetes. You don't, that, healthy people, it's very hard for any healthy person to get uh, into ketoacidosis. So we're looking at nutritional ketosis, which is anywhere from I don't know, one to four, it depends on the individual. Sometimes we've had people get up to five millimolar ketones, um, but, but you know, it's all in the health range. This is, we evolved as a species. Our ancestors during the paleolithic period uh, were always in some level of nutritional ketosis. There weren't any carbohydrates in the environment. They were seasonal. So most of us, our, our, our evolution passed on the, on the planet is mostly nutritional ketosis. So, but today, you rarely find people in, in nutritional ketosis because they have, their carbohydrate in the diet is so high, prevents the ketones from elevating. As soon as the carbohydrates come up, you start peeing out the ketones. So uh, it's a nice balance. You got to get the blood sugar down in order to maintain the ketones to replace glucose as a fuel. And the brain evolved to burn ketones. So, I mean, we use glucose for sure, 
But when glucose goes down, the brain will switch to ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate. And there's where you get some really interesting uh, new visions of life when you're in ketosis. You know? So um, when, when you're talking about using ketosis to treat the actual cancer, is that something that can also be used to prevent cancer over cancer cells? Growing? Yeah, um, for sure. Um, the the it, it, cancer starts with damage to oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. So, and this goes back to uh, what Otto Warburg uh, had clearly said. He he defined with no uncertain terms the origin of cancer. It's a replacement of oxidative phosphorylation with fermentation. So um, if you can keep mitochondria and the various cells healthy, it significantly reduces the um, uh, possibility of getting cancer in the first place. So um, it's very hard to get cancer, uh, even though you say to yourself, well, the, we have a cancer epidemic in the, in the society um, around the world, I should say, you know, they're saying what's a, it's an epidemic. And as I said, it's hard to get cancer because you really have to abuse the hell out of your body for a long period of time. And I know some kids, you know, children, infants, and sometimes will get cancer, but, but you, you look at their origin. And again, it's usually um, some sort of a intermittent hypoxia or something that blocked oxygen to the cells, therefore damaging the uh, mitochondria. So, but if you say, well, uh, if I can stay in nutritional ketosis, uh, which protects the mitochondria, and enhances the ability of the mitochondria to produce energy, this will be a very powerful preventative of getting cancer. And our uh, Aboriginal tribe tribes that we have on the planet right now, uh, who live according to their, their uh, traditional diets and lifestyles, often you find the, those folks to be in some level of nutritional ketosis. And cancer, of course, is extremely rare in, in those folks. So, uh, um, like the Inuits of, of Alaska and Canada, uh, uh, you know, cancer was unheard, unheard of when Western physicians started to look at those guys and they had very little carbs in their diet, you know, mostly uh, a carnivore kind of high fat fish, that kind. And African tribes, uh, Albert Schweitzer, the great physician and humanitarian, looked at 40,000, studied 40,000 Africans in their natural environment, couldn't find any cancer. Um, because these guys are living uh, with very low carbo processed carbs in their diet, a lot of exercise, and their mitochondria stay, stay healthy. Um, so, so prevention, unfortunately, today in society, nobody's interested in, not to say nobody, uh, I would say most people don't care uh, about prevention. Uh, we have an obesity epidemic. If people really cared about cancer prevention, you wouldn't find obesity. The obesity, there would be zero obesity epidemic. The fact that we have an obesity epidemic tells us that the society really doesn't care that much about prevention. Again, type two diabetes, uh, epidemic type two diabetes. If people really cared about cancer, there would be no diabetic type two diabetes epidemic. Well, so uh, that tells you right there what the what the interests are. Well, on that note, I'm curious. So I believe that part of that problem, right, is that people are not educated. They're not exposed to the information that lets them know that their obesity is a precursor to, to things like cancer. Right. So I'm curious because you mentioned earlier about how your research is being made public and you're trying to to reach the medical community, how receptive I guess, like what kind of reach are you getting in the medical community and how is it being received? Because I feel like so many, even even doctors who are such well-meaning doctors are not even on the up and up about metabolic syndrome in general. Mm. And many people, when they go to the doctor are not getting information and making that connection between food and their diseases that they're getting because so much of this uh, genetic, um, so much of the genetic component is being pushed. So do you have any insight on that? Yeah, well, that's it comes back to um, a critical issue is called scientific literacy. And um, unfortunately, uh, not just the our society, most societies on the planet are basically scientifically illiterate. Um, I hate to say that, but it's true. 
because what you just said is evidence of sci of the lack of scientific literacy. Um, you're right. The, um, the medical community should no have much greater knowledge uh, about this. But 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 at the other on the other hand, there's a lot of misinformation uh, that's pushed uh, out. Um, the food pyramid is predominantly upside down. Um, uh, there, there's so much, and I and the poor guy on the street, you know, gets here's this is bad for you. This is good for you. What's good for you was bad for you. What was bad for you now is good for you. And they kind of throw up their hands and say, the hell with it. I'm just going to eat whatever I want. And um, uh, and then they 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 just feel that the some of the experts themselves are all confused and they don't know what they're talking about. And and the bottom line is that there is a clear there's clear biochemistry. Uh, there There's clear hard science uh, that that tells us what we should do and shouldn't do. The problem is that that information sometimes becomes muddled and overlooked and misinterpreted. So um, there's no uh, misinterpretation of water only fasting. Um, I, you you can do, if you can do that, man, that's that's healthy, right? Uh, you stop what does water only fasting mean? It means that you stop eating um, <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, and what what happens when you stop? Now of course, it's not easy, believe me. Um, your body, blood sugar goes down. What, what, what are only fasting for all these different religions was always considered a way to purify yourself, body and mind. Uh, there's a lot to be said for that. And when we, when we see water only fasting, the body gets super healthy uh, when, you, when you do that. The problem is it's not, it's hard. And everybody would like to say, I want a pill. Uh, I want to take something so I don't have to walk over hot rocks to get my body healthy. Um, but, uh, you know, that cuts through everything. Uh, it cuts through all the misinformation. Forget about food pyramid. There's no food. You're just drinking water, uh, you know, and your body starts to get healthy. What does your body do? Well, it starts to go through a surveillance system. And that surveillance system is you better, every cell in every organ better start carrying its own weight at the highest level of metabolic efficiency, or we're going to take care of you. We have the process of autophagy where organelles inside cells are reconfigured into their, their um, a, a most efficient state. And if you have populations of cells like incipient cancer cells or, or cell populations that don't uh, carry their weight, the body attacks those cells, uses them for the food and distributes the energy from those cells to the rest of the body. It's unbelievable. So it's a, it's a house cleaning system that's absolutely thorough and, and doesn't care culture or religion or race or anything. It just goes through the body and says, we're going to clean house. And the problem is a lot of people can't do that. And they would rather have it as a pill. So, um, but, you know, when you talk about uh, food pyramids and nutrition and all this, and then of course, if you can follow that by consumption of organic, highly nutritious foods that are not processed, you would then maintain a much greater, healthier state. Um, it's hard. What? It, it, oh, yeah, it sounds great coming out of my mouth. Uh, but then you walk down the street, you find Taco Bell and and uh, Chick-fil-A and all these great tasting foods. And, and uh, you just go, I, I mean, it's, it's easier to just go, just go to take, take going to, go to get out of a big hamburger. Yeah, we're faced with these choices all day long, right? You go to the gas station, there's food. You go oh, yeah. you know, to your office, oh, there's no. vending machines. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. And it tastes good. It tastes yeah. good. It's not like it's been it's been engineered to taste good. Those Twinkies are all synthetic and, and they taste their they, I, I have a friend who works with scents and flavors. Uh, you know, they, they make perfume by looking at all the molecules and various flowers and combining them into an oil that would produce produce those things. Same with foods. They can break down the tastes of natural foods and reconstruct the the flavors back into synthetic things and it makes it taste like it's really really healthy and good for you but it's it's all synthetic it's not it's not real so uh, um you know and organic farms uh, are there uh but the problem is they their cost they cost more and a lot of folks that living on hand you know who don't have a lot of ex ex excess money they can't afford to eat the most natural and healthy foods so they're locked into these food deserts they call them 
where there's not, they don't have access to the really important things. And then they get sick and obese and cardiovascular disease, and it puts pressure on the healthcare system. And um, you have this problem. But I think scientific literacy uh, will help to some extent. So that's one of the things that I do in my in my classes here at Boston College. We teach scientific literacy. How do we how do we evaluate information that you see on television or in on the media? Where are the control groups? Where where are the the statistical differences between those that do one thing and and not do another? Um, you know, looking at the groups and how to an, analyze the data and, wh and what are the experimental designs in the way they they do things. So which we try to encourage and have kids, students look more and in deeply into this so they don't, they're not they're not given misinformation or they know how to detect information that's not complete uh, for for providing the whole picture. So uh, um, this is what I, one of the things that I, I do in the classes and it, and 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 it tries to give the students a better a better understanding of the, the, the kinds of questions that they should be uh, asking themselves and others when they hear things uh, uh, about this. Dr. Dr. Seifert, I just, I just want to ask, um, you know, I just want to touch on something you said earlier regarding uh, diet of like the Inuit and uh, certain populations in Africa, like the Maasai, who eat predominantly, I guess, sort of keto-based diets, um, even though I'm sure they don't have glucometers, but <laughs> it's just their natural diet. But um, is, so is the, is the idea, and I'm coming completely from an unscientific background here, but is the idea that that the the carbohydrates could help create mitochondrial damage that, that causes cancer um and and i guess the reason why i asked that is you know i i don't really have an understanding because glutamine also uh or cancer also ferments on glutamine right and glutamine is pretty much in every food imaginable so you can't you can't just jump to the conclusion that glutamine causes cancer. Can you no, do no, no, more no, 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 no. Glutamine does not cause cancer. You right. Gotta, nor does sugar. People right. Say, so oh, are are we talking about like processed carbohydrates here? Like uh, like no, what is your theory yeah. on that? What causes cancer is damage to mitochondria. Okay, that's what causes cancer. So all you have to say it's not anything you eat. Uh, Carcinogens. Why I call something a carcinogen? It's a chemical that causes cancer. How does the chemical cause cancer? It damages oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria of a cell, forcing that cell into a fermentation metabolism. So uh, if you eat too much of the wrong foods and you create a metabolic imbalance in your body, leading to systemic inflammation, systemic inflammation will damage mitochondria and some cell of the body. So you have to be careful about glutamine causing cancer, sugar, cord, none of that stuff causes cancer. Cancer, if you have cancer, they will feed upon those molecules, but the molecules themselves, these metabolites are not the cause of cancer. The cause of cancer is mitochondrial damage, chronic damage to the energy driving organelle in the cell. That's what causes cancer, okay? okay. I just want to clear up any confusion because like obviously some people might hear that and they might say well if you're saying that you know uh cancer f ferments off of glucose i've had some people mention well maybe i shouldn't be feeding my kids apples or you know certain types well, that's, of yeah, but that, that again comes back to the um uh, prevention issue there's two issues here one is what do you do to prevent cancer and the other is if you have cancer what do you do to manage the, the disease there's two different different things here, okay? And then of course, ketosis, nutritional ketosis can prevent damage to mitochondria, yes. So that's a prevention. On the other hand, when you have cancer, the cancer cells cannot use fatty acids or ketone bodies for energy. So you wanna lower uh, glucose levels. The normal cells can burn ketone bodies and fatty acids, but the tumor cells can't because their mitochondria are damaged. You have to have good mitochondria to get energy from ketone bodies and fatty acids. So the art, the idea for managing cancer, the strategy is to lower the fermentable fuels while transitioning the body over to non-fermentable, highly oxidizable fuels like fatty acids and ketones. So this is the strategy. So you have to under, you have to kind of separate the two when you're talking about cancer. We have the prevention strategy, 
And then we have the management strategy. And there is overlap between the two processes for sure. But you have to know how they, how they, they are similar and how they are different from each other. Now, when you talk about management, if you are in nutritional or therapeutic ketosis, what our research has clearly shown is that, is that drugs uh, are uh, the, the therapeutic benefit of cancer fighting drugs increases dramatically when the body is in nutritional ketosis. So even chemotherapies uh, that are highly toxic to the body, we found can be delivered in much, much lower dosages and have more therapeutic efficacy when the body is in nutritional ketosis than if it's not in nutritional ketosis. So, so we see, and we, we know that there are certain drugs uh, that work synergistically with nutritional ketosis to kill cancer cells even more effectively. So, so we understand this, but we would never use those drugs or procedures in the, in, a, in, the, in the strategy to prevent cancer. Not, there would not be that kind to prevent cancer. Okay, so how does can you speak to the glutamine component? Of that? Is that what you're referring to when you introduce drugs when someone is in ketosis? Are you talking about more of the yeah. glutamine innovation? Yeah. So, or? so yeah. So what we've discovered, and that was the missing link in Otto Warburg's central theory about how cancer cells grow, and also this the most which many people in the society, uh, oncologists or I should say, um, um, scientists who study cancer, they're mostly focusing on the energy the energy that comes from glucose through fermentation. Uh, but we have shown that the uh, glutamine um, can also produce energy in cancer cells through the pathway of glutaminolysis. A and um, that represents the second um, pathway that works together with the glucose pathway, the glycolysis pathway. And these two pathways feed off of each other uh, to facilitate rapid growth of the tumor. So, um, and we have to always say now glutamine, you're, you're on hundred percent, Scott, right on this. Glutamine is absolutely essential for the function of our gut, for the function of our immune system, the urea cycle and a variety of others. So when we target glutamine and cancer, we have to be very, very careful and not to target it too aggressively because you will disturb so many other essential parts of the body. So that's why we developed the press pulse therapeutic strategy. We can press glucose down because it's a non-essential metabolite. But when it comes to glutamine, we have to pulse it. We cannot, uh, uh, we cannot chronically target glutamine because if it's essential, essential, it's essential for so many normal uh, body functions. So we pulse it a little bit and then we pull off the, the drug and the procedure. So it lets the body recover a little bit and then we come back. So it's a very designed, clear strategy in trying to disrupt the two fuels that drive the drive the dysregulated growth. One, we can press down. We're not concerned about glucose. You can put glucose down extremely low levels and not, as long as the body is transitioned to ketones, you really don't need any glucose. Glucose is not essential for, for most of the organ systems in our body. So then we go after the glutamine with a, pulse, a pulsing strategy where we, we, we dose timing schedule to disrupt the availability of the glutamine and the tumor cells become gradually degraded because you're, de you're dealing with their very es e essence of their pathways that generate energy. So this is, this is the strategy. It's in its, in, it's in its earliest stages right now. And we're trying to perfect uh, this as we speak. Can you give us a little bit more detail around that? Like which, which drugs are you referring to and how do you pulse them? Um, yeah, the drug that we found to work best is 6-deoxynorleucine, which is Don. It's a glutamine analog. It looks just like very similar to glutamine, has one extra nitrogen. So when cells take it up, it kind of binds, binds up the enzyme that's necessary for making glutamate. So in order for a cancer cell to grow, it needs nitrogen and it needs carbons for synthesis of fatty acids. It needs carbons for the synthesis of DNA proteins, but it also needs nitrogen. And the nitrogen comes from the glutamine. So, um, so uh, the glutamine is metabolized to glutamate. And then this, this is metabolized to a, a, a metabolite in the TCA cycle called alpha ketoglutarate. And these metabolites are essential for developing new cells, uh, DNA, RNA synthesis, protein synthesis, lipid synthesis needs glucose and glutamine. Those two fuels are, 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 uh, can provide all of the necessary metabolites for rapid, 
rapid cancer growth. So in order to deprive the cancer of its nitrogen to make new DNA and RNA, you've got to, this coming largely from glutamine, you've got to be able to block the metabolism of glutamine. So Don does that. It's a, it's a fact that it's a, it's a dirty drug in the sense that it can block glutamine metabolism through seven, several different pathways or, or enzyme actions. And it's a really nice drug. The problem is it was misused when it was first introduced as a cancer therapy because they never targeted glucose simultaneously, nor did they use it in the right dosages. So we now uh, have found that that uh, can be, can be reevaluated and put into a new context of how to use that. So that's what I talk about dosage timing and scheduling is how, how what is the dosage? How often do we time this, this and how often do we schedule it with other procedures? Uh, some of the parasite medications, turns out parasites and cancer cells use common pathways to generate energy. So some par parasite medications, cancer is not a parasite. I don't know how many people tell me cancer is a parasite? It's not a parasite. Scott, I'm telling you right now, cancer is not a parasite, right? Do you hear what I said? Cancer is not a parasite. Parasites and cancers use some common pathways to get energy. So some anti-parasitic drugs will be effective against cancer because they target similar pathways. It does not mean that cancer is a parasite. Parasites and cancers share certain pathways. And that, and that has led some uh, people to think that cancer might be a parasite. I can't tell you how many people out there say cancer is a parasite. No, it's not a parasite, oh. right? Yeah, everybody uh, on the group. Oh, I've, I've heard that many times. I've also, right. heard the, I've also heard the theory passed around that, you know, cancer is, is actually a healing mechanism that your body produces to conserve energy. Is there any credence yes. to that at all? Um, yeah, and the earth is still flat and, <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the sun revolves around the earth. I mean, that's the kind of nonsense that you have to hear about every now and then. These people have no clue about anything. You know, uh, it's unfortunate that anyone would. That, and then the, the more, the more un, disturbing thing is that somebody will listen to these guys and say, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, and this is, again, comes back to science. Whether, sci, when you're scientifically illiterate, almost anything will make sense to you. So, uh, um, I, I, and this is one of the, the greatest stumbling blocks that we have, the lack of scientific literacy. Say it, Scott, the lack of scientific literacy underlies a lot of the crazy shit that we see in this society <laughs> <laughs> i love it uh, and it's everywhere it's yeah, that's right it's everywhere um someone in our group had a question of how long is it safe to be in a state of nutritional ketosis and i i know that you are a friend of dom d'agostino's maybe maybe you could use him as an example yeah well we should talk to dom he's always in nutritional ketosis and 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 he told he told me he says all of our paleo in ancestors were always in nutritional ketosis, so um, it's a natural state. Nutritional ketosis is our natural state. That's our that's who we are. We are uh, uh, an organism that should always be or evolved to always be in nutritional ketosis. Um, highly processed foods available everywhere prevents us from being in nutritional ketosis. And the epidemics of health problems that we see are due in large part for the fact that we are no longer in sustained nutritional ketosis because we wouldn't have all of these issues if we if we were all, but who wants to go back and live like a caveman? Um, you know, you know how hard it is to kill animals and eat them? Um, you know, people think, you know, we kill, we have developed guns and things to shoot the animals. But when when our when our uh, Paleolithic ancestors had to hunt them down with spears, uh, I mean that's tough. I mean you go out. Imagine if you had to. Everybody had to go out and kill some local animal to get skin them and cook them. And uh, 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 you know this is hard. This is hard stuff. <laughs> it's, uh, so yeah, I feel like and you're in gotten... nutritional ketosis when you're doing this. Yeah, I feel like we we've gotten so far away from our natural state. Now our natural state seems foreign to us, right? Like it seems oh, yeah. weird our, and wrong. And yeah, it's very clear. Yeah, um, the obesity epidemic. We evolved to store energy because we had very little carbohydrate. Carbohydrates converted to fat. Okay, if you look at your body, most of the our Paleolithic body, most of the glucose. Uh, was stored in the form of glycogen in the muscles. Muscles don't share sugar. 
okay? It, it, glycogen in the liver can be shared with other organs like the brain, uh, but muscle does not share its sugar, mainly because we need the energy of rapid muscle contraction to run away from the bear that's chasing us or the lion or some other member of our species that's trying to kill us. We, we, we need the energy in the muscles. So if the muscle were to share its glucose with the brain, oh, I see my predator coming, but I don't long, I can't run away because my muscles have no sugar. <laughs> so, so everything has evolved over, over tens of thousands and millions of years to give us a physiology appropriate for the environment that we evolved in, okay? So as a species, we've been around for about one and a half million years. For hundreds of thousands of years, we lived in a nutritional keto ketotic state. Then all of a sudden, our great technology and the Neolithic period allowed us to develop grains that had carbohydrates in it that give us more energy, build civilizations around this. And now we have a fast food industry that has crea been created that actually prevents most of us from ever entering nutritional ketosis, except guys like Dom D'Agostino, who is always in this particular, he's always showing me his ketone meter. Like he's always got a, a GKI uh, close to uh, one, five or one, or eight. he's always in that state. And I, I say, Dom, what are we eating today? He, well, sometimes you don't, you don't want to know what Dom's eating to keep him in nutritional ketosis. I mean, Dom would be perfectly healthy in the cave, in a Paleolithic period, you know. So, um, you know, but many of us, most of us in the society, could never go back to to that state. How um, how optimistic are you that this information is going to be more? mainstream say in the next 10 20 years what do you what do you see happening? you know it's i find that a lot of people are really really interested in it and as a matter of people a matter of fact you know people love to talk uh about calorie restriction and fasting uh especially after a big meal um you know but when you actually have to put it in practice you know you can wipe the smile off anybody's face with not eating for three or four days you don't believe me try it you know um but uh i think I think the issue, of course, more acutely is, is we have obesity epidemics. Uh, are, are, are the genes in our body that allowed us to store energy to keep us alive and, 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 uh, and actually develop as a species are now counterproductive um, uh, in, a, in an environment where we have massive amounts of poorly processed high carbohydrate foods. The same genes that allowed us to survive are now uh, storing all this energy. So I think people really need to know that we shouldn't blame our genes. Uh, we should blame uh, ourselves uh, as, as uh, uh, lacking knowledge and motivation to stop eating highly processed foods, <laughs> except occasionally. Uh, I'm not going to say we can't have a nice jelly filled donut every now and then. But, you know, like when I when I went to the to San Diego Zoo and the, the zoo here in, in, in Boston, uh, Franklin Park Zoo. I asked the, the zoo, the vet, the veterinarians who take care of the the primates, the the gorillas and the chimpanzees and orangutans. You know why 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 are these guys? Why why don't you go down to the uh, pizza shop and give them give them a double cheese pizza? Uh, they, they, oh no, can't do that. What about? I said, you think this orangutan would eat a jelly filled donut? Oh, I'd be all over the jelly filled donut. And and they said, oh, but, but it, it's it it, it 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 would be animal cruelty. You can't, it's very unhealthy to give a orangutan a jelly filled donut or a gorilla or a chimp. Uh, well, I said, what the hell, man? I said, we're the same. We have the same genetic background. Oh, it's okay for us to eat the jelly filled donut, but it's animal cruelty to give it to the chimpanzee. And yet we feed uh, that's our the dogs. That's the mindset that we have. And yet we feed our dogs Fruit Loops, basically, in their dog the food. Dog, right? The <laughs> dog is another wonderful species showing obesity uh, and cancer. Uh, wolves aren't obese, uh, and, and wolves rarely have cancer and all the dogs evolved, uh, were, were bred originally from the wolf and cancer is the number one killer of, of dogs. So, uh, in fact, the only thing we ever cured of cancer was a dog. And we published the paper in frontiers in, um, nutrition, a dog with a, uh, it's open access. Anyone can go into the science on their computer, go in and, and look at the paper we published on a dog with a mast cell tumor on his face. And the dog, the dog uh, uh, was completely cured of the mast cell tumor and died from old age from heart failure at 15 and a half years, uh, which was longer than the, the, the life of a normal pit bull, which was the kind of breed the dog was. 
So, so uh, clearly, and the dog just changed his diet. Uh, the diet was just completely raw, raw meat, uh, raw egg, fish, raw fish oils, and the cancer went away right away. Uh, will it happen in all dogs? I don't know, but it certainly worked on that one. Um, yeah, they they also um, get diabetes and uh, oh yeah, Cats all of these too. all of these human conditions because we've yeah. changed their food. And my my dogs have been raw carnivores uh, for years now, and and they're twelve years old and perfectly healthy so far. Yeah, no, it's abs it's very clear, it's very clear that that the, the diet nutrition is like underlies most of the problems that we have uh, in, in the medical field. Yeah, if anybody, chronic, I want to say chronic the chronic diseases. Let's put it right. Down. Yeah, and if anybody's curious about like, okay, well, is is keto ketosis really beneficial or is it safe? I mean, look at all the conditions it's reversing, right? It's not just cancer, but <laughs> yeah, epilepsy right. and Alzheimer's yeah. and polycystic ovarian syndrome. No, it's unbelievable. But it's mm -hmm. all going back to our evolutionary past. We were all in ketosis. We didn't have any of these diseases. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, but but now, I mean, our technology has allowed us to love the taste of this stuff. It's hard. It's like it's not like you have to kind of choke down a jelly donut because you don't like it. I mean, it's, you're looking for the next one. <laughs> Addiction versus nourishment though, right? Well, actually that's an important point. The brain is addicted to glucose. And when you when you go cold turkey on water only fasting, it's almost like withdrawal from alcohol and cocaine and this kind of stuff. So you, that's clear. I just have one more question about that. So what would you consider are some of the, the main carcinogens that we're exposed to now? Obviously diet, but maybe some things in diet like some people might say glyphosate or things in the environment. Yeah, well, there's so many of them. They're called forever chemicals. And uh, you hear that term a lot, forever chemicals. These are things that don't break down. Um, and uh, in our plastics uh, that get recycled into the water and the food supply. I mean, there's a lot of provocative chemicals. But, you know, the the, the issue is is that how, how important are those chemicals by themselves? Um, uh, as opposed to those chemicals working in a poorly nutritious environment as well. So, so you have chemical carcinogens in the environment together with a, a diet that has, is, is heavy into poorly processed carbohydrates, creating an inflammation, a, a background of inflammation. And then you have these forever types of chemicals that will then all work synergistically together to damage uh, respiration. Uh, there was an interesting study some many years ago uh, where folks took um, these uh, New World monkeys and exposed them uh, every day to tar on the skin. Um, uh, 20 methylcholanthrene is a chemical known chemical carcinogen. And they injected the, the chemical into the monkeys. They rubbed it on their skin for 10 years. And the monkeys never got cancer uh, in any way. Can you believe this? And then they said the monkeys are a poor model for, for cancer. The monkeys were eating their natural diet, which is contained an, an awful lot of, of plant-based uh, uh, anti-cancer kinds of molecules. What they should have done is they should have taken those monkeys and given them Twinkies and pizza and jelly-filled donuts and then rubbed the chemicals on their skin and see what happened and then injected. It. So you have to do the right context. So, so again, to get cancer is very difficult. I mean, you really have to abuse the hell out of your body, out of your mitochondria chronically. Chronic long-term abuse will cause cancer, type two diabetes, dementia, all of the things that we're spending billions of dollars on. So, um, uh, and people say, oh, we have an epidemic. Yeah, well, I mean, you have lack of exercise, you eat poorly nutritious foods, and you put yourself at risk for mitochondrial damage. I'm well, just I'm curious. Just, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Jen. I, I just, I, I have no idea. But I'm just curious. Do you have any, any experience or background with the relationship between the microbiome and cancer? Yeah, a lot of people talk about that. Well, I guess if you eat crap food, your microbiome's not going to be too good, right? So, what's right, that? right, right. If you and don't exercise, yeah. Well. And then, and then, of course, you know, everybody's oh, the microbiome, microbiome. Well, well then, when you a person would have cancer and they go to get chemo, massive diarrhea and all kinds of stuff. What do you think that's doing to your microbiome? You know, so if the microbiome were so important uh, and, and all this, forget, I, I think that's kind of a red herring. Everybody's interested in the microbiome. Forget it. You eat the right food. You don't have to worry about your microbiome. <laughs>
Yeah. It's just yeah, something. I mean, your, your microbiome oh, everybody is, loves to talk about the microbiome. Your, your microbiome is feeding on whatever you're feeding, right? So, right. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's an epiphone. It's a downstream thing. And there's like a billion organisms in there. Oh, this population and this population and that population. You know, I mean, our, ans- our paleolithic ancestors never could care about a microbiome. <laughs> mm-hmm. And they didn't have any of these diseases. So, um, yeah, it's something that people like to talk about. You know, I, I don't consider, I don't want to waste my time talking about it. I I just want to come up with a question from your life. I know I said that was my last question. This is officially my last question, unless you bring up something really interesting that might spawn into another question. But um, I know you know Guy Tenenbaum. I've had him on my channel a couple of times. Same with Freddie Vard. And uh, they talk a lot about uh, using SCOT inhibitors and, and certain, you know, natural supplements to, uh, you know, to, to uh, I guess, kill cancer cells. Do, do you have any, do you have any beliefs on that or hold any weight on that? Okay. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's a massive, unfortunate misinformation. Okay. Succinyl-CoA oxotransferase is Scott. Okay. Um, in order to, in order for a cell to use a ketone body, you have to have active Scott. Okay. So beta hydroxybutyrate is broken down to acetoacetate in the mitochondria. And succinyl-CoA oxoacid transferase allows that beta-hydroxybutyrate to generate uh, acetyl-CoA, which is the energy that's needed uh, that ketone bodies provide to our normal cells, okay? Now listen to this. Cancer cells don't have SCOT. Cancer cells have deficiency in SCOT. They can't use ketone bodies. They can't break ketone bodies down, okay? I have looked at a lot of cancer cells. Cancer cells don't have already deficiency in Scott. They have deficient Scott. Our normal cells have normal levels of Scott. So so normal cells can burn ketone bodies for energy. Cancer cells cannot burn ketone bodies for energy, okay? Because they have no no Scott. So for someone to come out and say, oh, we should take Scott inhibitors. If Scott inhibitors really, really worked, then you'd be dead, all right? because your normal cells couldn't transition to use ketone bodies if you inhibited Scott. So the, the, it's absolutely an absurdity to, to use what, to even speak about Scott inhibitors. And I told, I told Mr. Tannenbaum and I told others that this is absolute nonsense. And if you ever had a drug that would be an inhibitor of Scott, then the cancer cell would kill you faster than anything. So the, the fortunate thing is that the inhibit, Scott inhibitors that those folks say to take don't work. Thank God they don't work because if they work, you'd be dead faster from what they were talking about. And that's again, the lack of scientific literacy. When you lack scientific literacy, you do all kinds of crazy stuff. And that's one of them. You should that, have a debate with, you should have a debate with Dr. Berg about that. Cause he talks a lot about Scott. And yeah, I, I told him, I told Eric, uh-huh. I said, you got to stop talking about that because it's absurd. And I tell, it speaks to the lack of knowledge on some folks. I'm in the lab all the time doing these experiments. I studied Scott. I looked at Scott. I have access to the scientific literature. Those folks don't, and or they don't understand it. And that's the problem. That's one of the problems. You got to. You have to speak to people that know things. And when you, how do you know things? Because you work on the, stu- the systems yourself. You study them in the lab. You're looking at the. You're looking at Scott as an enzyme activity. I've studied it. I've looked at it. Cancer cells have broken Scott. They can't use Scott. So why are you using a Scott inhibitor for a cell that already has a broken Scott? So that Scott inhibitor, if it inhibits Scott in normal cells, you wouldn't be able to use the ketones to enhance your health and vitality. It makes no sense to do stuff like that. So um, there's no debate. It's like, you know, is the sun the center of the solar system or is it not? Is there a debate about this? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, Jen, did you have any last questions? No, but I, I did want to thank you. You know, we, we depend on people like you out there doing that research and learning these things and teaching the rest of us because, and also lending validity to what we're seeing clinically, right? Like we, we clinically see ketosis reversing chronic illness and mental illness and nervous system conditions and brain conditions. And, and Mm -hmm. so you out there speaking and lending validity to what we're finding and also educating us and helping us become more scientifically literate. (laughs) Yeah, we right. really, we really appreciate the time and energy that you're taking to to preach the word, speak the message, right, for more people to hear. 
Yeah, I think it's important. And thank you very much for uh, have, having this interview. Yeah, you, you've been an absolute warrior in the uh, in the cancer community. And I think, you know, so many people have uh, to thank you for for saving their lives. And that that's a huge deal. So I, I feel like this is a true honor, uh, just being having you on here today and being able to talk to you. And I really appreciate that. Um, before I let you go, I just want to uh, share the screen with you. Um, and this is part of a docu-series that you're that you've been part of. Uh, that our friends uh, Brad and Maggie Jones have, have uh, produced and, and directed, uh, Cancer Evolution, um, which is coming on September 21st, 26. Um, can you give us just maybe a very brief synopsis as to what this is about? Is it mostly regarding uh, metabolic therapy? Yeah, I think to the most extent, I, Maggie, Maggie, as you know, her story, she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer that metastasized to her brain in a very short period of time, and then transitioned to a metabolic therapy and was able to manage her, her, her cancer, um, you know, based on the concepts that I've shared with you. Um, yeah. So I think more and more folks are starting to realize uh, the power of, of nutritional ketosis in managing cancer. I'm, I'm giving a, a keynote speech. I should also mention that uh, we, my colleagues and I are in the process many with many of these folks on the list here to produce a comprehensive treatment protocol for cancer, a uh, how-to manual uh, that uh, anyone, any, any licensed practitioner of medicine could immediately apply to their cancer patients. So, uh, and many of the folks on that, on that screen uh, were are, are co-authors uh, with me uh, on, on this treatment protocol. So, uh, yes, um, the cancer revolution is coming, uh, uh, and I'm hoping it comes faster than 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 some people think. But as soon as we realize that cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease, the the sooner we're going to have uh, a a major drop in the number of cancer deaths. Right now, it's over 1,600 people a day dying every day from cancer, which is a complete, it's not necessary. This is a tragedy of monumental proportions when it doesn't have to happen. And once you realize that you can manage this disease with metabolic therapy, uh, that, that will drop that death rate majorly, very, very, very quickly, actually. But it just takes time for this to penetrate into the medical communities and not only to penetrate, to be accepted. And, and uh, uh, there's powerful forces that prevent the acceptance uh, of this. And it goes right up all the way up to the National Cancer Institute when they have on their website that cancer is a genetic disease, all of the biology textbooks, cancer is a genetic disease. This is misinformation. Cancer is not a genetic disease. And that concept is what perpetuates the continual death of these patients indirectly. So once you change the theory and understand the new theory, deaths will stop, will will drop that death rate. So that's what's it's, it's a however long it takes for the information to get out. Cancer is not a genetic disease. It is a mitochondrial metabolic disease that can be managed with metabolic therapy. How long will it take for the society and the medical communities to realize this? And I'm providing the, the hard evidence to say this is the way it is. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm going to like the uh, in the description below information on how you can watch the world premiere of Cancer Revolution docuseries. But I, again, I want to thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. don't forget Cree. that we, we get, we our research is, is driven by philanthropy and private foundations. So uh, it's important for people to realize that. We have now uh, philanthropists coming and donating money to uh, Travis Christofferson's foundation because they want to be part of the change not to make money on it, just to say they were part of the of the revolution that's that's now uh, coming on this whole uh, cancer thing. And it's going to drift over to type 2 diabetes and these other chronic diseases as well. But right now, cancer is the big dog that needs to be tamed, and we can do that. I really hope down the, down the road, um, you know, you'll be seen as, as a true hero and pioneer of this, this movement. I know Otto Warburg sort of got the ball started, but it seems like you're the one who who really um, brought this back into prominence. This this idea, and uh, you're right. We're well, he 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 took he started it. We're gonna we're gonna take it over the goal line. 
So, um, and, and, and uh, what he would, what he didn't problem with Warburg is he never came up with a therapy based on his knowledge and uh, the therapies were not as effective. We now know how to, how to take what Warburg did and move it into a, into a, uh, an applicable therapy.